I love you. Dr. David is in the studio. There he is right there. There he is. He made it. He made it. Driving his father's Genesis. Do you know what a Genesis? You know, that's, that's a great name for a car, you know? It is, isn't it? Yeah. 2010 still runs like a charm. Well, I got a 2006 van that's 180,000 miles on it. And all your grandchildren love it. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I, I, this is the truth. I used to buy in Buffalo, New York, where I worked in a large company there. Uh, I, 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 I've always loved cars. I, I'd have a right share in about every six months, I'd have a different car. Like I mean, I had, I was buying and selling cars and and my son said recently, he said, Dad, if you could have gotten a big warehouse and put all of the cars that you've had in there, which a friend of mine actually did, he said, do you know what you'd be worth today? I said, it would be a, quite a pension. You'd be the Christian Jay Leno. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. But a friend of mine, his name is Alan Thomas. He lives in the Buffalo, New York area. Every Corvette that he owned, he parked in this warehouse. Wow. They, it's in the millions now of that, the worth of that warehouse. And he was just, you know what he did for a living? Bank teller. Wow. So, you well, know, I mean, it's like an hourly job. If he drives any of those Corvettes out of that thing into the Buffalo weather, they're not going to be worth much at all. <laughs> That's right. Because this guy right here. I think I'd rather just live here with, a, a BM, with the VW. Than Dr. Living. David, of all <clears> things, <throat> our daughter meets him in Liberty University. He was the jock on campus, the best football player. He, he, was, he was very athletic. All the girls wanted him. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep going. Yeah, keep, keep going. coming. Keep going. And well, what is there about athletics that, that females just adore? I don't know. It never worked for me. <laughs> but but it, Colleen spotted you, and you spotted Not her. as an athlete. She never came to see a single game. Really? No, she didn't. Know. I was done with football by the time I got to meet your daughter. I was finished. I was what, what was your? What was your? You, you got? You got a? What was a golden helmet or something? A golden helmet and the Rock Royer Macaulay Rivera Award. Nice awards from the school. So you had that ability that pain did not affect you when you were running, because you were you you put the head down and go right into the guy. I I I love football. Yeah. Did you ever? Did you ever get knocked out? I never, <clears throat> never got knocked out. No, no. But you loved it. I loved it. It was fun. But I was right. when it ended, I was ready for it to end. I actually had a red shirt year, my first year of seminary. I could have played one more year. And I, by that time, I, I, I was so focused on seminary and learning the Bible and getting ready to preach, I, I, I was ready to say goodbye wow. to it. But Today's subject. Why don't believers have peace? Part two, a continuation of last week's discussion. Yeah. I hope you joined us last week. As, <clears throat> it kind of is a build-up to where we're going to go today. But it's, it's, it's entering because we as Christians should be the recipients of peace. And yet, if you put an unsaved person here, they would have lack of peace. And you put a saved Christian here, and they would have lack of peace. What is that? Well, I, you know, I th we are recipients of peace. We don't access it. We have it in our reservoir. It's been given to us. We don't access it and we don't apply it because of our uh, misapplication of faith. And one of the things we talked about last week was that we worry. And we identified worry as being the intense comp contemplation of things that we fear won't happen, that, that, are, that are good, or things that are bad that we fear will happen. But it's, it's contemplating things that we fear. We worry, which Jesus commanded us and instructed us and equipped us to not do. And then the opposite of that would be peace, trusting the sovereign benevolence of God in the midst of change and uncertainty. So we can have peace, even though there are things that uh, uh, generate worry, we can respond with peace. So okay, if, if I had, looking at that definition right there, if I had the ability, and I'll use this term, to trick my mind and put trusting the sovereign benevolence of God in the midst of change and uncertainty, and I say to you, I got it. 
That's me. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. Uh, you, have to, you have to apply it, and you'll have to reapply it and reapply it and reapply it. Every new day is a new challenge of faith. But it's not really a, tr I know you didn't mean it as a trick of the mind. It's not a trick of the mind. It's an awareness of what's actually true. You're not tricking your mind. You're recalibrating it to see what is actually true, that God is sovereign and God is benevolent and He can be trusted. The world tells us the opposite. Our fears tell us the opposite. Our fears are what is tricking our mind. Our worldly philosophy what it is what, what is tricking what, what our mind. What are we fearing? That things that we want to happen aren't going to happen or things that we fear might will happen. That's what we fear constantly. We're in constant contemplation of the uncertain future, wanting to control it and have it turn out the way that we like. And we can't let go of that desire to control all things. And in one way, it's what was tempted in the garden. I, I, when, I, when, uh, when Satan said to Adam and Eve, you will be like God. Yeah. You can control all things. I was watching David Jeremiah uh, on, on this network uh, a few days ago. And he said, he, he said he got to that place where he realized that he, need to, he needed to surrender to the Lord. I mean, I mean just give himself over because he wanted to really have the Lord use him. And he said, the thing in my mind constantly was, if you do that, he's going to call you to Africa. Did you ever... I, mean, I heard that a lot when I was a teenager, but it didn't, it didn't scare me. But I remember people talking about that. Oh, I, that, I mean, I'm telling you that, that I could identify with him. It's like, you know, if I, I, I want to do that. But if I do that, this thing is going to happen in me. And all of a sudden, I've got this missionary mind, and I've got to go to Africa. Well, I mean, that, that's that fear, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's, it's an illogical, irrational, unverifiable contemplation of something that may never come to pass at all. And therefore, we, over, we overlook the good that's right in front of us. So that's why the Bible tells us to walk in faith. And sometimes He only clears the path for each step. We don't get to see the whole path. Or we wouldn't even start the journey. It'd scare us to death, more than likely. He says, trust me, take my hand, and let's walk one step at a time, and I will get you where I want you to be. Do you, have you ever been in that place? Which place? The fear or the that good place? Where, where, trust me, and, 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 you, and, you, and you just say, Lord, I want to walk with you, but I'm afraid. Have you ever been there? I've been in all those different phases, yes. I've been, in, I've been paralyzed by fear. I've been racked with uncertainty uh, where I couldn't uh, even contemplate uh, what was going to happen next or get any rest. And then I've had total release of any concerns and knew God was in control. And if bad comes... It's going to be controlled by the good hand of God, and I'll take it. I've been in all those different places. I, I know, and the peaceful place is much better than all the other ones. Yeah. <laughs> I know from experience. It's kind of like the guy said, I've been poor and I've been rich. <laughs> rich Trust me, <laughs> rich is a lot better. <laughs> yeah, same thing. Peace, I, I've had peace and I've worried, and peace is a lot better. Wow. So to summarize last week, I put it in one sentence. Points one through six were, we worry about things that are temporal without... Factoring in God's presence, trusting His benevolence, resting in His knowledge, or having a proper perspective. Wow. That was last week's. Yes. So we want to add to that this week. And number seven would be, we don't keep our mind fixed on God. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because He trusts in you. So, okay, in... Dave's going to explain this. So, are you paraphrasing what that says? When you when you des describe what that means. Okay, uh, let's say uh, I'll give you an, an antidote from Scripture. When Peter walked on the water, you remember how he walked on the water, then all of a sudden he wasn't walking on the water any longer, and what the Bible says happened in between. He was walking on the water with his eyes fixed on Jesus, and when he noticed the storm that was raging around him. It distracted him from his complete, utter trust in Jesus who said, come. So the focus changed. The focus changed. He was no longer fixed on God. He was fixed on the challenge. And that caused him to rely on himself. Well, this, how, how am I walking on water? What? He was no longer trusting in God's, God's call to him. So you take that as an anecdotal story, which is a true story, and apply it to our lives. If we don't keep our eyes fixed, our soul, our spirit, our mind fixed on God, His purposes, His will, His nature, His faithfulness, 
we will instead look at all the opposition and all the challenges and we will then be racked with worry okay. instead of peace. Give us the how. How? By scripture number one, reading the word of God to recalibrate again the brain to think the way the Bible presents truth and then prayer to commit it in prayer to present our bodies a living sacrifice which means God you can do with me what you want and for you know a couple of hundred years in early church history that meant you were going to be martyred. So when you're surrendering yourself to God you're not saying I know only pleasant things are going to come my way. It means what will come my way is, is what you want it to be. Wycliffe is the one that was burned at the stake, right? Yes. Can you imagine the night before he knew that was taking place? And was it, was it the words that he said were, oh, that I had more than one body to give? Uh, well, he did say, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Okay. To the, which is fascinating because it's the King of England who eventually authorizes the English translation of Scripture, of which Wycliffe was the earliest versions of it. But can you imagine, Dave, tied to that stake with all of this? No, I can't imagine. This no, I, ready I, to I, burn, it, throwing whatever they threw on there, probably some kind of fuel, and lighting it. No, I. Now, now, any, any, I mean. It's, it's supernatural. It is that peace that passes the understanding of the moment <laughs> that God gives. It would be like Stephen, wouldn't it? Yes, or, or, who looked up and he saw Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. And that was all he could even focus on. And the, the Bible says they, they saw such a glow. The Bible says there was a glow about it. Yes, him. They, they knew something was happening beyond their control and they had to stone it out of existence. So how do we, how do we get that kind of peace? Well, that level, that supernatural transcendent peace God imparts in moments of extreme, in the crucible of, of difficulty. We don't have that just every day. That's a special endowment of peace that God gives to martyrs and those who are facing that. The closest thing I could ever say, and this is, I hate this, uh, it seems so simplistic, but I had a taste of it one time when I was doing a pro-life uh, um, protest outside of New York City. And a policeman was, was choking me. And he had his hand around my neck and was pushing my head against the wall. And I remember thinking, I'm, go I'm going to pass out or I'm going to be choked. And this is all going through my mind as I'm looking at the policeman. And I'm thinking, I could die because this man was enraged. I, I could die from this. And then all of a sudden, I had this peace overcome me that I thought, well, if I die, I'm dying standing up for the Lord. And I remember I, I felt such peace. I smiled at the policeman. And he saw my smile and he let go of my neck and he backed up and just backed away. And I watched him just, he walked maybe 15 yards backwards just wow. staring at me as he left. Well, for that five, 10 seconds, I felt something I had never felt before. But he apparently, he apparently felt something too. I don't, I don't know. God backed him off. But I felt at that moment a peace that didn't make any sense. That why would I have peace that I'm getting choked? That's, I think, that's just a taste of what the martyrs feel when they're dying for Jesus and God overwhelms them with this sense of it's going to be okay wow. and I'm here. Oh, that's so good. Uh, so we don't keep our minds fixed on God. We, we, we put our mind on all the things around us. Number eight, we don't look to Christ for peace. We look to everything else. John 14, 25 through 27, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We look to the world instead of looking to Christ. Keep that on, Dave. Read and that one more time because I, I just sense that we so quickly read because this is God speaking to us. This is not David, even though you're hearing his voice. This is God's word, and he is actually speaking to us. Read that again. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Wow. So when we come into a moment of crisis, a moment of challenge, a moment of uncertainty, as he said back in Matthew last week, don't worry about what you eat, drink, or what you put on. We look to those things for peace. We look to those things for comfort, for a sense of security, 
for a sense of certainty. We don't look to Christ, we look to the world. So when a moment comes up, we then try to resolve the issue and gather to us the uh, accoutrements of the world that will give us peace instead of pausing and looking to Christ and access the peace that He's already given us. Uh, he gave it to us in the form of His Holy Spirit living inside us. But we don't, we don't go there for whatever reason. We get too distracted and we're too conditioned to think purely on a physical, material realm. We don't access the immaterial, the, the spiritual world. Wow. Um, the next one is we don't rejoice in our ultimate victory. John 16, 33, he, he again then says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, peace and good cheer don't go along with tribulation unless you realize Christ has already won the victory. We don't focus on the victory. Well, we it, focus on the tribulation. Okay, he won the victory. Just keep that on the screen, Dave. He won the victory. Why aren't I having victory? Well, you, you do have it. <clears throat> what you see as defeats in your life have nothing to do with the ultimate victory that's already been secured for you. You're going to go to heaven when you die. Give me your worst situation of your life and then follow it with, and I go to heaven when I die. What can possibly match it? I got cancer, and I'm dying of cancer, and I go to heaven when I die. <laughs> My loved ones all got killed by a communist regime, and I go to heaven when I die, where I'll see them again. And I go to he We don't see the ultimate victory. We don't even focus on it. We just ignore it because we're, we're so wrapped up in the pain of the moment or the anguish or the fear or the sense of loss that we can't look past it. And Jesus said, Be, have peace and have good cheer because you're going to have tribulation. He bracketed tribulation with peace and good cheer. And then he gave us the reason, because I've overcome it all. You just don't know it yet, but you've won. So if somebody said to you, Herman, you're going to be on the New, England, the New England Patriots on their worst year ever. They're going to lose nine games, but they're going to sneak into the playoffs. Everybody's going to be hurt. You're going to get hurt. You're going to squeak through the playoffs, just barely making it, a couple of lucky plays. Then you're going to make it to the Super Bowl, and you're going to win the Super Bowl. Would you want to be part of that team? If you knew the end result that you're going to be Super Bowl champion, all that suffering would be irrelevant to you. It would just make the victory sweeter. We don't look at the victory. We look at the suffering so we don't have peace. Wow. Does that make, does that make I, sense? I love that. I, that's wow. And the next one is we don't intensely anticipate heaven. And uh, I have to say, that was certainly true of me many, many times until you gave me the book by Randy Alcorn, which changed my attitude about this. We don't really intensely, emotionally anticipate heaven. John 14, 1 through 3. This is Jesus speaking to His disciples. Let not your heart be troubled, or don't let it have anxiety or worry. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's funny you should say about uh, Randy's book. Keep that on screen, Dave. Uh, it's funny you should talk about Randy, because you can't know how many times when something really comes across my path and I go, what in the world is happening? I... I will reflect on how he used scripture to say, Herman, this is not your dwelling place. Yes. I have prepared something for you that you have no, I mean, you, you, you now know, but you know that it's coming. Right. It's not, it's not a fantasy. It's coming. And, and it's beyond your imagination. Say if you're, your whole, as a child, all you ever knew was that little carnival that came into town. Yeah. But somebody told you about Disney World. You never saw it. You couldn't even imagine it. All you had in your mind was the carnival that came into town with the rickety little machines and the dirty horse. And, yeah. and then you go to Disney World. And all along, Disney World was promised you, and you're going to get to live there. But you can't, you, you can't rejoice in it, because all you know is this little carnival that comes in once a year to your neighborhood. That's the perspective. We have no grasp yes. yeah. of what heaven is, so we don't anticipate it. We don't intensely look forward to it. When I was at Liberty, at, in the early days of the football team, things were very, very primitive. And we practiced on a place called Treasure Island, which was an island in the middle of the James River, surrounded by water on all sides. You had to have a bridge to get over there. 
Well, it would get so unbearingly hot in the summer, three-a-day practices. The steam would rise off the uh, river and float onto the island. So you just, you're just you just dripped in sweat. You're dying. Like living in Louisiana. Yes, and, and it, it was because it was humid, hot yeah. Virginia summer. And at the end of practice, you had to run wind sprints. And you see, one of these wind sprints, you're already, some guys are stopping, they're throwing up. It's horrible. Well, what would get me through it in those days was about 200 yards down to the other side was a swimming pool. And it had been there because it's a youth camp. Well, there was a swimming pool down there. And the coach would let us, if we could get there, when the sprints were done, you could jump at the swimming pool. Was your uniform on? Oh, no, that came off as you're running, okay. which is a, a hilarious thing to see. Okay. So you're, you're doing these, they're horrible, they're terrible. Well, what got you through it was you knew how cold that water was and how great it was going to feel to get in there. So when that last sprint ended and the whistle blew, we would turn and race towards that swimming pool, throwing off our stuff as we're running, and then just jumping into that pool. And I remember going, floating up where just my lips and my nose would be out of the water because your blood red from the heat, just trying to cool down. Well, it was the anticipation of that pool that would get you through those wind wow. sprints. If we had an, intensity, an, an intense anticipation of heaven like that, we would, we would be able to endure so much more because our focus would be the glory How that's waiting for us. How do we get there? And again, I know, I know that I'm, I'm telling you, Randy Alcorn's book on heaven, because it's scriptural. He spent eight years putting that together. That is, like you just said, uh, fantastic. that is, that is fantastic. helped me. It had a, it's kind of like, like the, the seeing the pool. Yes, you finally get an awareness of the tangibleness of yeah. what heaven is, that it's not floating around in clouds holding on to harps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah. There's a tangibleness to it that's beyond what we can comprehend, um, and it helps. But it begins with reading the Word of God, right. believing it, praying, and then the Bible tells us in Philippians that He will give us the, the peace of God, and if you think about things that are true, just, holy, uh, things that are worthy, things that are full of virtue, things that are full of praise, the God of peace will be with you. It has to do with what we contemplate, what we meditate on. And if we don't meditate on Scripture and the truth of God and the goodness of God, we're never going to have peace, which is the next uh, verse coming up. We don't pray and we don't meditate on God. Now, meditate is pray, right? Meditate is, is, is a conscious contemplation of a truth. Now, Eastern meditation is the loss of conscious thought, un, of directed thought. It's to find a way to release your brain where it no longer is thinking directed thought. You're letting something else take your mind and direct it. That's not biblical meditation. Wow. Biblical meditation is directed thought on a truth or a person. And this would be the person of God. <clears throat> so in Philippians 4, 6 through 8, be anxious, and it's the same word for worry, marimnate, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, or by everything, with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. What, the, what is the difference between prayer and supplication? Those would be just different aspects of prayer. Prayer would be talking to God. Supplication is, is bringing to Him uh, our requests. Okay. It's coming to Him with a need. Thankfulness is your attitude. And then let your request be made known is the verbalization, the specific request. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Notice he does not say, and God will answer the prayer. That's not the promise. Uh, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And the next phrase is, and the God of peace will be with you. Wow. So, if we don't have peace, it's an automatic indication we're not praying and meditating to the degree that we should. Yeah, I've memorized those verses, and boy, did they, did they help me. Oh, it, it changed my life in a, an event back when I was in college, and I've, I've relied on the truth I gleaned from that passage about trusting in God, talking with God, thinking on God, and then toiling for God. It's a four-point sermon. I have gone through that exercise more times than I can count to pull myself off the ledge of falling into anxiety and worry, but it has to be deliberate. You have to pause to pray instead of worry. You have to meditate on the things of God rather than obsessing on the thing that's causing you to worry, and that's what we have a hard time doing. We can't let go of the obsession we have with the things that we fear won't happen or the things that we fear will happen instead of focusing on the God who is. We all have 
specific uh, personality traits. Your DNA, does that make a difference in how you trust or how you have anxiety or how you have this way of looking at something and making it worse than it really is? Is that, is that your DNA? Is that your personality? That's just like my dad? That's just like my mother? Or does that enter into this? Well, I would say my natural tendency is not to trust, not to have faith. When is that I was, your DNA? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. I would assume it's in the genes, but when I was growing up, my mother, one of her favorite names for me was Worry Wart. I, I worried about everything and had, if there was something that had to get done, it had to get done now. And I was always worrying about things. That's where you did so your homework, right? That's, that's why I, I did it first thing before I went out to play because I couldn't focus on play if I had homework sitting back there. So when, when the Lord saved me and dwelt me with the Spirit and began, the fruit of the Spirit began to grow in my life, worry never has really left, but it has been, it has been saturated with the peace of God. And when you become a Christian, you don't become superhuman. You don't lose all traits of your natural life because Paul himself said, the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I want to do, I don't do. There's a war raging within me. That's in Romans 7. Well, if it was in Paul, it's going to be in you and me. So we have a tendency to worry. To whatever degree you're a natural worrier, let's say, there's a supernatural uh, endowment from God to meditate on Him and the things of God that He might grant you peace. And in this very special way, His manifest presence, the God of peace will be with you. But it all begins with having peace with God. The Bible tells us we have peace with God because of the Lord Jesus Christ, the price He paid, the death that He um, uh, suffered, and then He rose from the dead in victory over death that He might then give us peace because He purchased it. Peace with God, and then it follows it with the peace of God. And those special occasions when you're really meditating on Him, the God of peace, you sense His presence. That's available to us every single day, regardless of what's taking place out there in the world. Jesus said, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You can trust Jesus Christ. We have truth. What do we do with it? We access the Word of God that gives us that peace because I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Trust Him. Bye -bye.